bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, praise your name, Jesus. Praise your name, Jesus. Praise God. This is always a special time of prayer and time of fellowship with our people when they can come and have their needs met. It's always a warm time for me. I always feel really, really warm when we do this because, uh, you know, heretofore we've been unable to do it, but with this new arrangement, it's really, really meaningful. I've had a lot of people say that they really appreciate this. You may be seated. Pastor is going to be coming in just a moment to receive uh, God's tithe and our offering, but uh, we received a, um, a note about God's incredible blessings. Praise God. God's in, in, incredible blessings. Uh, this person has been working at the downtown YMCA, and um, uh, it's a Christian organization, as you know, and uh, uh, this person is talking about how God has come and, and uh, helped them as a graduate, graduate of our, our school, by the way. And um, this particular uh, person uh, mentioned that in order for uh, them to stay in Pensacola, they needed to find a job that would sufficiently cover uh, the needs and um, this person that they were talking about <clears throat> uh, mentioned where he was employed uh, that um, that um, they were in need of some help and uh, and he was in charge of the hiring and so the next night the person brought uh, this individual an application and told him to come in the next day at noon and the application was filled out walked in the office took a drug test had their fingerprints run and was hired and now making $10 an hour, have full benefits, and best of all, won't have to miss Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, or Sunday services. Hallelujah. And in addition to that, this person says, since I'm a graduate of school, I'll also be able to help out at the school. And my boss told me that the night he walked in and saw me reading my Bible, he knew that he wanted to hire an employee like that, and he gave me conditions for my employment. And here they are. I can't call him by his first name. I have to continue to work at least one day a week at the YMCA because the members need to hear about the Lord. I have to bring Scripture to work every day to share with him and his fellow employees. And he said also not to sell my fellow, uh, or tell my fellow employees how I received the job. Hallelujah. <laughs> Isn't God great? Give God glory. Well, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? You know what I want us to do? I want us to stand up right now and just let the devil know we're glad to be in this building. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. You're good, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. Come on, praise him. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're talking about incredible blessings. You can be seated. Talking about incredible blessings. It's just incredible that what happened to our building happened in the way that it happened and in the time that it happened. First of all, there was nobody in the building that night. Normally we have service every Thursday night and there was nobody in the building. Secondly, um, it happened at a time that gave us a window to get a lot of work done on our building that ordinarily we couldn't have paid for ourselves. I just met with a builder last Monday and the insurance adjuster was here and it looks like by the time we move back in, we're going to be moving back in essentially to a redone building. Paid for. Paid for. They're going to have to tear all the roof out because when the lightning came in through the uh, metal plumbing pipe, it went down through the plumbing pipe and immediately went into our electrical room upstairs. Uh, there was no structural damage done to any of the major beams in the building, just a little bit of burn marks, which can be fixed. 
and there was one purling in the top that was affected. It's going to be replaced. But the whole roof is going to be tore off because all the conduit for the whole building is up under the roof, right behind the insulation. That's where the fire was. So what's going to happen is um, we're going to get a whole new roof out of the situation, which we needed. And um, I would just like to say that the fire department did an excellent job. Uh, they went the extra mile. They contained that fire in one area, and they made sure as they were fighting the fire that they took every precaution to protect everything in that building they could possibly protect. I'm going to write them a nice letter because even after it was all over, the firemen came back in and squeegeed that building. They got all the water up, and they just went the extra mile to take care of Brownsville, and we want them to know we appreciate it. Amen. <clears throat> But God has been so good to us. Everything is just going to be wonderful. We have, um, we have probably um, three different kinds of damage to the building. We have one that's cosmetic. We have one that's going to be a little bit of structural. <clears throat> and then we have a lot of uh, technical damage. Uh, one of our air conditioners was completely destroyed. One of the big air conditioners outside the sound board that goes from the sanctuary and the television department was completely destroyed. And there's a lot of other stuff that I could mention. <clears throat> but I would imagine just a rough guess, and this is an uneducated guess, we probably had a uh, million dollars damage, maybe a little excess of a million dollars of damage between those three type uh, damages. They're going to take all the pews out and store them in tractor trailers and try to treat them for smoke damage. And if they can't treat the pews for smoke damage, they're going to take the wooden pews back up to Archibald, Ohio, and they're going to put new padded pews in the church. New pads on our pews. Our pews are made out of solid, solid oak, so they'll probably put new pads in the pews. And we really needed that because after seven years of revival, <laughs> a lot of people have come in. And a lot of kids and young people have poked holes in some of our cushions. A lot of them were in bad shape. And we couldn't have afforded to replace those. There's so many things that needed to be done in that building. Not long ago, I was in there praying, and I walked around and looked. And I just saw things everywhere. I'm a perfectionist. I can't help it. But I just looked around the building everywhere, and I saw things that needed to be repaired. And I thought, man, you know, to repair this, it's going to take quite a bit of time and quite a bit of money, and we don't have the money. So a lightning bolt came on July the 4th. So it's actually going to be a blessing, I believe, in disguise. I wanted to encourage everybody here today that God is in control. Um, the paper quoted me as saying that the devil did that, and I'm glad I could give the devil credit for that because I don't give God credit for destroying his own house. And so a young man emailed me. He said, I read your article in the paper where they quoted you saying the devil did that. He said, you don't have any Bible for that. He should have never said that. <laughs> because the Bible said in the days of Job that God said, I'm turning everything over concerning Job into the hands of the devil. And the Bible says they even called it fire of God that came down. But it was actually the devil that did it. Amen. And when Jesus rebuked the storm, I don't think he was sticking his finger in God's face and saying, you know, you shouldn't have sent this storm. Jesus rebuked the elements. He rebuked the storm. And I believe that that was something that, you know, you don't rebuke God. You don't rebuke your father. Jesus was in total obedience to his father. And so when he rebuked the storm, he was rebuking the works of the enemy. So God is not in the business of destroying his churches. But... I do believe that uh, there's a silver lining behind every cloud. And I also want to say to you, we, are, we have entered into a time of incredible blessings. If you're going to have incredible blessings, you're going to have incredible attacks. Please understand that. Let's everybody get used to that right now. That if you're going to have an incredible a blessing, get ready for an incredible attack. I've often said I feel sorry for folks just going through a little attack because they got a little blessing coming. I feel sorry for folks going through a mediocre attack 
because they got a mediocre blessing. If you're going to go through hell, go through it right. Amen? Go through it right. So uh, I said this last week, and I'll say it again today. People have been calling and writing, emailing, and all kind of stuff. And they're saying, Brother Kilpatrick, how much more can y'all take? Oh, Brother Kilpatrick, it's just horrible. But I say this. We are a tremendously blessed church. And we, well, I didn't mean to sound braggadocious in the paper. I didn't want it to come out like that and sound like that. It probably looked like it, but I didn't mean it like that. When I said that the devil's fooled with the wrong man and he's fooled with the wrong church, that sounded a little bit arrogant. I didn't mean it to sound that way. What I meant was, I'm a blessed man, and this is a blessed church. So the devil fooled with the wrong folks. If he thought he was going to bring a curse, you remember Balaam went to bring a curse, but when he opened his mouth, all that would come out was a blessing. So I want to just tell the devil when he comes around 3100 West DeSoto Street, you better watch out because God's going to go ahead. Because God has an uncanny way of taking what the devil intends for evil and making it good. So I just want to encourage you today. You may be going through some stuff. You may be under attack. How many of you are under attack? Let's be honest. Let me see your hand. Almost the whole church. <laughs> Glory to God. I am too. But I've learned one thing, and, and I've learned this, and it's not just a sermon with me. It's the truth with me. I practice it. Everything is Father filtered. Say it out loud. Everything is Father filtered. There's nothing that happens to us that the Lord does not know and see and understand. And it goes through his filter. And by the time it reaches me, I may say, Lord, I don't understand. And I'm not going to necessarily rejoice because of this, but I'm going to rejoice in this because I know that you're going to bring glory to your name. Amen? Amen. Now, I want to encourage you today concerning your tithes and offerings. Those of you that made pledges to BRSM, if you're able to pay those pledges right now, we certainly need them. Let me tell you why. Right now, you see, the crunch time is when the school let out in May, from May until it takes back in in August, there's May, the latter half of May, June, July, and the first half of August, which is about three or four months. There's no students there, but salaries continue, utilities continue, mortgage payments continue, but there's nobody out there. And so when Steve came in and graciously raised those pledges for us, he raised them to be paid by September. But <clears throat> right now we are in a crunch time where we could certainly use the pledges if you're able to pay them. And we certainly appreciate you making the pledges to BRSM. School will be starting back in about a month. And the Lord is helping us, and the Lord will help us. It's amazing how every time there's a crunch time, God always comes through. It's a miracle. And by the time we start back up the second week of August, it will be just a history of miracles over the summer, how God preserved the school and how he helped us. And I'd like to say to you today, don't forget your tithe. I hope that you're not becoming lax on your tithe. Uh, I want to encourage you to continue to keep the conduit open from heaven to your life. And the way you do that is by tithing. That keeps an open conduit, an open free flowing pipe of God's blessings coming to you and it's the tithe. Boffin said this and I'll say it probably again and again, God does not need your money. It's not what he's looking for because he owns the wealth of the world. God's not looking for your money. What God is looking for is your obedience. God said, I give you seven days. I want one of those days. That's a fair deal, isn't it? And then God says, I'm going to give you 100% income, but I want you to honor me with a tenth of your income. Tithe means tenth. Tithe does not mean an offering. An offering is when you decide that you just want to help somebody or you want to help the church or you want to help a ministry, something beyond tithes. That's an offering. 
but tithe is tenth. And people have asked me the question so many times, Brother Kilpatrick, do I tithe off of the gross or the net? Why do you even ask the question? Just tithe. Um, I tithe off of the gross. I don't tithe off of the net. I tithe off of the gross before taxes. I tithe off of everything that I get right up front, right off the top. That's the way I tithe. That's the way we've always tithed. My wife and I have been tithing all of our life. Matter of fact, we just celebrated 34 years yesterday together. We celebrated 34 years of marriage yesterday. We were married July the 13th, 1968. We both looked a little bit different back then. At least she did. I, uh... No, no, see, you took that wrong, friend. You took that wrong. She still looks good. And, um, yeah, well, hallelujah. Let me move on anyway. <clears throat> now, I'll tell you, let me say this. A man could not be blessed with a better wife than God has given me. My heart safely trusted my wife. And um, we had a wonderful anniversary together. And so that's that. But anyway, we've tithed all of our life. I tithed before I met my wife. I've been serving God since I was real young. And even when I worked part-time before I even got married, I have always tithed off of every check that I've ever made. I've always tithed. And God has always blessed me. Always blessed me. One of the ways that God has always shown his faithfulness to John Kilpatrick is whenever I get in a tithe, either in the ministry or personal. God always miraculously comes through and helps me. So I can testify to you as an example that God is faithful. And don't be one of these friends that starts tithing for a while and you say, well, I'll try it and I'll see what will happen. Because if you do it for that reason, the Lord knows the intent of your heart. You see what I'm saying? He knows the intent of your heart. What God's looking for is a commitment that you're going to do it come hell or high water thick or thin, whether I'm blessed right up front or the blessings come later, or whether I'm not even blessed, I'm going to still honor and obey God. That's what God sees whenever you begin to tithe. So today I'd like to encourage you to stand and hold your tithe up. Those of you that are tithing, those of you that are giving your offerings today and paying your pledges, if you will please just stand and I'm going to speak a blessing over you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for blessing Brownsville. And isn't it wonderful also to have this building to move into? Yes. Just move right across the street into this building. It's just such a blessing. Lord, your blessings are so wonderful. <clears throat> God's holy word declares that if you will bring his tithe into the storehouse, that he will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, there will not be room enough to receive it. Do you believe that? Yes. God also boldly declares that he will rebuke the devourer. So he cannot and will not destroy the fruits of your labor. Therefore, I proclaim incredible financial increase upon you and your house. I call in jobs for those of you who are unemployed. I call in better jobs for those of you who desire and need them. Put your faith in that right now. Lose your faith in that right now. I call in better jobs for those of you who desire and need them. I bless you for a breakthrough where what has been clogged up and restricted will break loose and begin to normally flow again. And because of your obedience and God's tithe and offerings, I declare God's favor to be upon you so that those things that's been tied up in the court, such as your inheritance, godly settlements, and estates, be released so you may begin to enjoy what God is meant to be rightfully yours. And God has stated that he wishes you to prosper, so therefore I speak a blessing to come upon those of you who work in sales and commissions. I speak that deals and opportunities be attracted to you and that God prosper you in an extraordinary way. 
I speak over this giving congregation that opportunities for advancement will come to you. I call forth raises and bonuses as you need them. I call back to your residences and your wallets and your bank accounts what the devil has attempted to steal from you. And as with Job in the Bible, I speak that you be restored double what has been lost or stolen. And because the Lord rejoices over his children and he delights to see us happy and blessed, the Lord will cause you to find money unexpectedly. He will bless you and surprise you with unexpected checks in the mail right out of the clear blue. And for those of you that God has blessed as entrepreneurs, may your mind be inspired with God ideas and God inventions so that you can prosper. For those that own your own businesses, lose your faith right here on this. For those of you that own your own businesses, I speak that blessings come upon your company to the point that you can begin to bless your employees with good pay and package benefits. And don't forget when your business is blessed to remember your employees. The I speak that a spirit of abundance come upon this congregation that God miraculously bring you out of debt so that the stress of debt and the burden of debt will release your minds and that you will come into a brand new peace and a new reality of financial freedom so you and your children may serve God in newness and in joy. May you and your house begin to enjoy plenty so you may give liberally and generously in offerings as well as alms to the poor. Brownsville, hold your hand up everybody. Brownsville, I bless you. From the top to the bottom, from the front to the back, from the top to the bottom, from the bottom to the top, from the back to the front, from the front to the back, from the left to the right, right to the left. I bless you in the name of Jesus. And I speak that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Woo! I speak that no weapon formed against you will prosper. I speak in the name of Jesus that any weapon that the devil may be formulating right now to come against you, that God will obliterate that weapon and it shall not in the devil's hand. And I speak that the blessings of God will come down just like the hole in the roof of Brownsville. That there will be a hole in the roof of this place and that the blessings of God will pour down upon this congregation. And may Brownsville become a byword in not only the people's mouths of this city and this county, but this state, this nation, and the world. And may they say, don't fool with those people because they're different. God's blessings is upon them. Before you come, let me say it again. You're going to be a byword. I make that proclamation. You are going to be a byword. People are going to say, man, they have been attacked and attacked and attacked. But you have never seen such a blessed pastor and such a blessed church as Brownsville Assembly of God. Devil, hear me. Jesus. You cannot curse what God has blessed. You cannot curse what God has blessed. And I speak in the powerful name of Jesus that the blessings of the Lord will flow over this whole congregation like the oil off of Aaron's beard. And people over the world will look at this place and say, the devil tried and tried and tried, but God always turned it around. Now come. Praise the Lord, O oh God of my soul, and all my being praise His name. He laid aside His throne just for you. He laid aside His throne just for you. He forgives you all your sins. And heals all your disease. Sing, church. Praise the 
There's a healer in the house. We don't have hymn books out there, so you'll just have to sing this from memory. But I got up this morning with this on my heart. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Well, what a forte sing. Oh, what a forte of glory divine, of glory. Of salvation, heir of salvation, purchase of God. Sing Brownsville, purchase of God, born of his spirit and washed of his blood. Born of his spirit, oh, I want to 
want you to lift your voice. Y'all ready? This is my soul. singing this last verse and I was thinking about how many people in this world, in this city don't have any rest but in the Lord there's rest I said in Jesus there's rest he said come to me you broken hearted and you're heavy labor and I'll give you rest how many need some rest this morning well take the yoke of the Lord on it's an easy light yoke to carry, come on sing perfect perfect submission all is in rest. Come on, y'all. I and my Savior. I and my Savior. I'm happy. And I'm watching and waiting. Watching. Exactly. Come on, praise him. Praise him. All the things he's done for you, just begin to say, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We're not spoiled children. We thank you. Father, we thank you for every breath because it's your mercy that lets us breathe another time, Lord. We thank you for our church, Lord. We thank you for our city, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we had food on our table this morning. We thank you for our families, Lord. We even thank you for those that are coming into the kingdom that are not here yet. We thank you in advance, Lord. But most of all, most of all this morning, we say thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the nail. Price you paid. 
Bearing all my sin and shame In love you came And gave amazing grace Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail-pierced hands Washed me, washed me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know. Come on, church.
song before we're done, okay? Father, into your courts I will
bless you, Lord. I bless you. Bless you. You may be seated. Thank you so much. <clears throat> can you hear me okay? Um, can you hear me in the back? Hold your hand up if you can hear me in the back. Okay, good. I'm glad because I'm having some throat trouble today. Well, I just can't pass this up. I got to show you my new grandbaby. I want to ask John Michael and Elizabeth to bring my little grandbaby up here, Isaiah Michael. Look at that. <laughs> Ship off the old block. Glory to God. Isn't that sweet? This is Isaiah Michael. And we wanted to congratulate John Michael and Elizabeth on this fine baby boy. You did good, son. <laughs> God bless you. Awesome. July is a powerful month for the Kilpatricks because today is my other son and his wife's anniversary, a marriage anniversary. Is Scott and Karen here? Scott and Karen here? They're way up there, okay. This is as far back as you can get, son. Stand up. Right there. <clears throat> How many years? Twelve years today. Today, the 14th of July, they wanted to get married as close to when men Brenda got married as possible because they saw how good it worked for us. <laughs> so they chose that date. <clears throat> I want you to turn with me to, today in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 2. Is that a familiar chapter? I only have four points. Which will take 30 minutes apiece. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Don't anybody get upset. Now today, I'm going to go until I get through. <clears throat> I don't think it'll be that long. But I want to go until I get through today because I have some instruction that I want to give to you. I'm coming to you today in the way of instruction. Those of you that have a pencil, piece of paper, and you'd like to take notes, this would be an ideal time to take notes. Those of you that would like to get a copy of the tape after the service, this would be one of those tapes you'll want to get that you'll want to keep in your archives of tapes this will be one of those because this is something that I'm going to deal with that I have never heard a sermon on. I'm going to be dealing with the Holy Spirit. I started part one a week before last. Today is part two. I'll probably have a part three and probably a part four, but I don't think it'll go past four parts. I'm dealing with the Holy Spirit and the title of the series that I'm dealing with is entitled and the Spirit gave utterance. And the Spirit gave utterance. Now, <clears throat> in the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 4, the Bible says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and begin to say that word now. Speak. Say it out loud. Speak. And they began to speak with other tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance. I could go on, but that's where I want to take my text. 
and that's where I want to focus for just a moment. I want us to look carefully at something that I think is so crucial in a Christian's life. Now, first of all, I want to remind everybody that you are in a Pentecostal church. And whenever I say a Pentecostal church, I mean a church that believes in the work and the ministry and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're a Pentecostal church. That's where you are. I make no apologies for being Pentecostal. We Pentecostals sometimes take a lot of um, blasting from other denominational people. Sometimes Pentecostal people are looked down on, or the devil tries to make us, make the church world look down on Pentecostals as low class, ignorant, unlearned, emotional people. But the truth of the matter is, the devil tries his best to slander Christians that believe in the full works and ministry of the Holy Spirit because the devil is afraid of the Holy Spirit. He's afraid of it. So today, for the next little while, I want to cover about four points. <clears throat> and I want to talk to you in regard to this series as the Spirit gives utterance, and I want to deal with a prayer language. And like I said, it will be an excellent time for you to jot down some notes and just make a few notes. Because I want to take my time today and I want to talk to you. I want you to relax and I want you to comprehend. I want you to get everything off your mind. I asked a while ago, I said, how many of you are under satanic attack? And just about everybody raised their hand. Let's, let's do it again. How many of you are under satanic attack? Just about everybody. I'd say at least three quarters of the congregation. If you are not under satanic attack, go ahead and bat down the hatches because you will be. Yeah. Now, the Lord said to the disciples, he said, I will not leave you alone. He said, I've got to go away. But he said, I will not leave you alone. I will send the comforter. Now, everybody look this way just for a moment. One of the things that the church world is comfortable with is the comforter, the comforting part of the Holy Spirit. That's not offensive. They can handle that. The church world looks at the Holy Spirit and the role of a comforter like, oh, okay, that's sweet, that's peaceful, that's nice, that's acceptable, we can accept that. But when you start talking about the Holy Ghost giving utterance to speak in an unknown tongue, the church world gets real uneasy. That's where the lines are drawn. But I want to make it extremely clear today to everybody that it's in your Bible. It has not passed away. It's in your Bible. It's all through your Bible. The Apostle Paul wrote three-quarters of the New Testament and all through the books in his epistles. He talks constantly about the Holy Spirit. He talks about tongues. He talks about all kinds of things, and I'll cover a little bit of them this morning. And if you believe in the Holy Spirit to the degree that you believe in the Holy Spirit, that's the degree that you will tap into Him and He will manifest in your life. But you know, I've found that it's hard for people to lose their faith into something they don't know about. Most denominations don't have a problem talking about Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, they'll tell you when you received salvation, you were filled with the Holy Spirit, which is true to a degree. You did receive the Holy Spirit. But there's a difference in receiving the Holy Spirit and being baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire with the evidence of speaking in unknown tongues. Now, I want to just make this clear to you before I move on. I am not afraid nor ashamed to tell you that I speak with tongues, that I believe in tongues, and they are more valuable to the body of Christ than you can even begin to imagine. They are valuable. The reason why Satan puts that slant on the tongues part is because that's the part 
that scares him the most because he doesn't understand them. God sent Jesus to die for you on Calvary. He shed his blood for you. He resurrected on the third day. He walked on the earth for a period of time. And then he went out on the Mount of Olives and was received up into heaven. He died to become our Savior and our Redeemer. He lifted up off the earth from Mount Olivet and he went back to heaven and he sat down. When he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, he now operates in the role of a mediator. He intercedes for us. He mediates for us, for the church. He oversees the church. And he went back to heaven to be seated at the right hand of the Father to make intercession. So right now, you have to understand that Jesus' role is not on the earth right now. It's in the third heaven at the right hand of majesty where he is seated in the role of an intercessor and a mediator. Now, that's Jesus as we know him now in the church age. Before he left, he said, I am going to send you the Holy Spirit. And when he has come, he will take the things of me and he will reveal them unto you. He will show them unto you. When you talk about the Holy Spirit, you're not talking about an it, you're talking about a he. Now I want you to understand something. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the... Holy Spirit. Now listen. The Holy Spirit is a co-equal. He is a co-equal. Say that with me. He is a co-equal with God, with Christ. He's a co-equal. Now, when Jesus went away, he did not entrust us to an angel just to stay beside us all the time and watch over us. When Jesus left the earth, he relegated us to the Holy Spirit himself, which is the third party of the Godhead. And he said he will not only be with you, but he shall be in you. How many of you can say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. He's in you. He's in the breath that I breathe right now. He's not only with me, he's not only upon me, but he is in me. And the same with you. He's in you. Now, if he's in you, what is he in there for? Just to comfort you? That's one of the things he does. But there's so much more that the Holy Spirit is in you for that the church has not tapped into, especially in this time when it's so unpopular to be Pentecostal in America. It's really popular to be Pentecostal in other nations of the world, but in America, it's really looked down on by many denominations. So why did God send the Holy Spirit to live on the inside of you? Holy Spirit is sent to you to change you into the image of God's Son. He's sent to change you into the image of God's Son. So that means He's going to be speaking to you. You say, Brother Kilpatrick, can the Holy Spirit actually speak to me? Friend, I worry if you're not hearing from the Holy Spirit. He speaks in a number of different ways. I don't have time to give you the ways. One of them is he speaks by revelation. He speaks with a still small voice. He speaks with impression that you may give expression. He speaks with visions. He speaks through prophecy. He speaks through many mediums in your life 
to help you, to enlighten you, give you direction. But there's one area about the Holy Spirit in your life that I don't know if you've ever thought much about, and I'll deal with it in just a moment. I'll get there. But let me take just a moment and talk to you about four different um, avenues that tongues serves in the New Testament church. There's four different avenues, and I'll give them to you quickly. These are not my four points. These are four other points. <laughs> There's four functions of tongues in the Bible. The first is tongues is for personal edification. God gives tongues an utterance of the Holy Spirit. He gives it to the church for personal edification. Secondly of all, he gives tongues as a message that can be interpreted by someone that has the gift of interpretation. That's why the Bible says, if you speak in tongues, you edify yourself. But if you speak in tongues in a body, like in a church like this, you need an interpreter, one that has interpretation. Look this way just for a moment. When I talk about interpreter and interpretation, I'm not talking about they're interpreting exactly every word that you spoke in tongues. It's that when you speak in tongues, you're speaking out a language, but the interpreter does not interpret that language like you interpret Spanish. They're giving an interpretation of what the Spirit is trying to convey to that church. You understand that? So there's tongues for personal edification. There's tongues that are given for interpretation so God can get a message through to the church body. There's tongues that is given for intercession, where the Bible talks about groanings and moanings, which cannot be understood. That's a tongue that God gives in intercession so that the Holy Spirit is interceding through you with a noise, with groans and moans. He's using your vocal cords. You're giving expression to something that's going on on the inside of you. But when Holy Spirit groans through you and moans through you, Jesus at the right hand of the Father as the intercessor and the mediator understands what Holy Spirit is saying to him. Are you listening to me? Yes. Say it with me again. Jesus is not here. Jesus not here. He's seated at the right hand of majesty. He's seated, right He's seated there as an intercessor. He has sent us the Holy Spirit. To dwell within us. Holy Spirit will pray through us. Jesus, the intercessor, will receive that intercession. And Jesus will pray to the Father for us. See? You see? It's a language of heaven. Let me explain it to you in a little bit better way. You remember in the Old Testament, there were three different areas that God gave to Moses for the children of Israel in their tabernacle worship. You remember there was the outer court, there was the holy place, and then there was the most holy place. You follow me? There was the outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place. The outer court represents the flesh. The holy place represents the soul. The most holy place represents the Spirit. Now, anybody could be in the outer place where the flesh is. Anybody could be. When you got to the holy place, which is the soul, also. But when it came to the most holy place, even Satan himself could not enter there. Are you listening to me? There's things in regard to your flesh as the outer court where the devil harasses you and troubles you. There's things in regard to the holy place representing your soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions, where the devil harasses you. He can really harass you in that area of your soul. But when a person learns to break free 
past that realm into the most holy place, behind the veil, so to speak, in the presence of Almighty Jehovah God. That's a place where the devil can't go. When the Holy Spirit is sent, glory to God, he was sent at Calvary when Jesus died and left this earth on the day of Pentecost when they celebrated the Feast of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, he came like tongues of fire and he sat upon each of them and he gave them an utterance. You know what happened? He moved into your spirit. And he moved in with power. And he moved in with a language that the devil can't get into. He didn't move into your soul. He moved into your body. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And he moves from your body right into the inner sanctum of who you are. That's your spirit. He communicates with God. Spirit to spirit. Deep calling unto deep. It's a language. Oh man, I feel that. My God, I feel that. Whew, it's a language. And the devil was always afraid of that most holy place. Only the priest could go in. And if he wasn't right, they had to have a little thing, palm granites and bells. If they quit hearing them, they stuck a rod in and pulled him out. He's gone. Amen? Powerful place. When the Holy Spirit comes into a person's life, he is a comforter, but whoa, my, 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 he's more than a comforter. He's awesomely powerful. He's powerful. He is intelligent. He knows things. He knows things. Your mind doesn't know. He can pray about things that you can never think of to pray about. You say, how does he do it? He does it through the prayer language. He just goes past your intellect. He goes past the mind. And the Spirit of God begins to pray through you. And he touches heaven for you. You give the utterance. He's praying through you. He's interceding through you. He's touching Christ at the right hand of the Father. It's a direct contact. And whenever you begin to move into that prayer language, it's a language. It is a, it is a dialect that hell does not have any handbook to interpret. He can't understand it. I want to say this before I move on. That's one of the reasons why hell fights Pentecostals and Pentecostal churches and tries to get people to really turn against Pentecostals and Pentecostal type worship because if Holy Spirit can ever get you to turn against that, he knows that he's pulling you out of a realm that really bothers him, really troubles him. Some of the most powerful saints in the world have been Pentecostal saints that knew how to intercede in the Spirit of God. Powerful saints. If I'm dying, you get an old gray-haired granny come in there and pray for me that knows how to pray in the Holy Ghost. Forget these big name preachers. Just get me a gray haired granny that's lived for God, paid the price, lived the life. She knows how to move in the spirit. Bring her in there. I'll pay her airfare. Get her in there and get her to pray for me. Hallelujah. I don't want no flaming evangelists coming there and praying for me that don't know how to pray in the spirit and move in the gifts of the spirit. Bring me somebody, a no name, that knows how to touch God. Oh, give us mothers and fathers in Israel again that knows how to move in the power of the Holy Ghost. Are you listening, church? It's a language. Now, there's four different areas of tongues that the Bible mentions as far as the believer. Number one, for edification, number two, for interpretation, number three, for intercession, and number four, a sign for unbelievers. You say, Brother Kilpatrick, what does the sign for unbelievers mean? What's that all about? You remember on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says, as they begin to speak in tongues, they thought they were drunk, you remember? They come staggering out from the upper room, and as they begin to hear them speak in tongues, 
They were speaking in dialects of people that had come from all over to Jerusalem to worship, and they began to hear them speak in their tongue, and they knew they did not learn that or know that tongue, and it was a sign for those people, something's going on here. How many times has a visitor come to the church from another nation, another country, a heathen, and just wound up in church somewhere? And while the preacher's preaching, maybe the Spirit of God will come on him. He starts speaking in tongues, and he starts speaking in the dialect of that person sitting out there that knows he had no way of knowing that dialect. And he's speaking to them in that sermon. You understand? I believe that's one of the ways that tongues is a sign for unbelievers. It bypasses the mind. It bypasses education. It bypasses talents. It bypasses abilities. It's an utterance and a gift of God coming through a temple, your temple of the Holy Spirit, in those four ways. Now, let me get started on point number one. When you begin to pray in the prayer language, a supernatural exchange takes place as Holy Spirit begins to work in you. That's number one supernatural exchange it is a supernatural exchange turn to Acts chapter 8 Acts chapter number 8 and we'll go to verse 26 this is such an awesome verse right here don't ever get so accustomed to reading your Bible that you lose the awe of a scripture. Amen? Let's look at it, verse 26. The Bible says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Now look this way just for a minute. Let me explain this to you. Look this way just for a moment. Do you know what infirmities means? Huh? What is it? What did I say? Did I say Acts? It's funny how everybody misheard me in this building. It's <laughs> Romans. I'm sorry. Everybody just misinterpreted me, see? Romans 8 and verse 26. Have you found it? Yeah. Romans 8 and 26. Look, this, look, look at this. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Now, isn't that an interesting way to put it? What is an infirmity? It's a weakness. An infirmity is a weakness. It's an inability. So when the Holy Spirit comes in your life, God sends him not only to just be a comforter to you, but he sends him to you to help your inabilities and your weaknesses. And if you don't believe you've got weaknesses and inabilities, <laughs> I don't think I have any problem convincing you of that. For we know not, the Bible says, what we should pray for as we ought. Isn't that interesting? We don't even know what to pray for. You know what? Look this way, everybody. Those of you watching me by television, listen up. If you have a struggle in prayer and you can't think of anything to pray about and you can't think of anything to pray for and it seems so repetitious when you pray, it could be you're restricting the Holy Spirit in your life and you're only praying about what your soul and your mind can remember, and at times your soul and mind become so overwhelmed with life, you don't even pray. You just quit praying because you're so overwhelmed. But the Bible said he sends the Holy Spirit because we don't know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And look at verse 27. He that searches the hearts. Wow. He that searches the hearts knows 
what the mind of the Spirit. What is the mind of the Spirit? Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Wow. You see that? Everybody look this way just for a moment. Let me read it to you. Just listen. Just listen closely. It says that the Holy Spirit searches the heart. He's in there. He knows how to search your heart. He searches it. He knows what's going on in your heart. He knows what resides in your heart. He knows the obstacles. He knows the blockages. He knows the sin. He knows the fears. He knows all of it. And so here's what he says. He searches the hearts. He knows what the mind of the Spirit is. And he makes intercession for the saints according to God's will. Man, you can cut through a lot of chase by allowing the Holy Spirit to pray for you because the Holy Spirit can always and will always pray the will of God. We're not through yet, though. Look at this. We know that all things work together for them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purposes. I wish I had time to cover that 28 in regard to the Holy Spirit. I don't have time, but I'll try to get to it later if I can remember it. Now, he searches our hearts with intentions of removing everything that's contrary to the will of God. Look this way. If the Holy Spirit is in your heart and he searches the heart and he makes intercession according to the will of God, it means that one of the major works of the Holy Spirit is to uproot everything in your heart that Holy Spirit sees is there that's against the will of God for you. There's a lot of things that's in your heart that's not in the will of God for you. That's when the Holy Spirit living in you will rear up. And if you let him in the prayer language, he'll begin to pray for you according to the will of God. And the first news you know, if you'll release that prayer language, your mind will begin to change about some things and some people in your life and some circumstances and some situations. Your mind will begin to change. Why? If you prayed about it, you could just pray just a little, while, a little while about it, but your heart wouldn't be in it because your heart is in that sin. But Holy Spirit will pray about it, and Holy Spirit will pray and hit the bullseye of the will of God, and as he prays for you, he'll begin to show you there's some things in there that needs to go. And the first news you know, your heart begins to change toward those things that's in your heart. That's how he helps you. Wow. Man, you can't afford to be without the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to tell you something else. You can't afford not to pray in the Spirit either. He's sent by Christ to conform you to the image of Christ. How many of you would say there's some things in my life that I don't think is like Christ? Whew. Holy Spirit's got his hands full when it comes to the church. But you know something? Just like Holy Spirit's in my heart, he's in your heart. Isn't that amazing? He's in all of our hearts. And then you take every church in Pensacola, every church in Florida, every church in the United States, every church in the world, every Christian in the world. Holy Spirit's doing the same things in them he's doing in us. We need to tap in and let Holy Spirit get us ready. Whew, he's, oh, hallelujah. He's making a bride. He's getting a bride ready. Man, there's so many things in your heart that you're not even aware of that if you'll let Holy Spirit, he'll begin to show them to you. He won't lash you. He won't embarrass you. He won't even intimidate you. But he will, as you let him pray through that prayer language in your life, he will begin to expose some things, and all of a sudden you'll notice your attitude begins to change by the things that he's exposing in your heart. Amen. So your mind can never discern it. Your soul, your mind could never discern it. But when you move into that most holy place and the Holy Spirit begins to move in and do his thing, wow, what a change. Now, how many of you will be honest with me tonight or today and say, Pastor, there's just times the devil really beats me up. 
Could I see your hand, please? The rest of you is lying. <laughs> you are lying. You ain't made out of the same material I'm made out of. Glory to God. Let's do that one more time. How many of you will say, Brother Kilpatrick, there's times the devil just really beats on me. How many, how many of you, the devil tries to really intimidate you and tell you you're no good, put you under condemnation? Oh, there's nothing to you. Boy, if people just knew how you was, if people just knew the half of who you are, they wouldn't have a bit of confidence in you. And you start listening to that garbage and you start going in the hole. See? Oh, man, you think God's going to hear you when you pray? You think he's going to hear you? They ain't nothing to you. You're a nobody. You've never been nothing. You're as much of a sinner as anybody else. You go to church over there. You give a little bit of money. You sing them songs. But I know who you are. Ah, you're no different than everybody else. I know what's in your heart. They don't. But I know you. You're a hypocrite. How many of you have ever heard that kind of stuff? See? Case closed. But I want to show you the important function of the Holy Spirit. Turn with me to the book of Jude. Chapter 12. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Man, I feel the Lord here. Ever since I've been speaking, I just felt cold chills all over my head. Ever since I've been speaking, just cold chills all over my head. I feel him so strong today. And I know this is taking root. I can feel it taking root. Jude, verse 20. Look at what this says. But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Look at that one more time. But you, say but me, building up myself on my most holy faith by praying in the Holy Ghost. Now I want to ask you a question. Why isn't that preached stone? Why do denominations across the world that really has a problem with the Holy Spirit and tongues, why do they want to take an eraser and erase such scriptures out of their Bible when they're some of the most important scriptures in the Bible? Let me tell you why. Because when you pray in the Holy Spirit, when you pray in the Holy Ghost, you edify yourself. You build yourself up in the most holy faith. Now, I asked you a while ago, how many of you, the devil ever intimidates you and beats you down? Everybody raise their hand. You know what praying in your prayer language does, praying in the Holy Ghost does? It builds up your faith. You know, when the devil comes in and he starts this business, you ain't nothing. I know you. You're a low-down, dirty scum. I know who you are. You ought to just say, well, blah, 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 you know, just take off. Just take off. And then he'll say, ah! <laughs> Just start praying in the Spirit. And here's what the Bible says. It says, praying in the Holy Ghost, building yourselves up in the most holy faith. It didn't say building yourself up in faith. It said building yourselves up in the most holy faith. I'll talk about that, too, in the course of this message. Most holy faith. Now, that's something else right there. I got a lot of ground to cover. We may go ten parts, glory to God. Is that all right? Yes. Hallelujah. Watch this. Build yourself up when you're being attacked. Build yourself up. Run somewhere and pray in the Spirit. Let the Spirit of God begin to pray through you. You know, I'm amazed at people that's been raised in Pentecostal churches that when it comes to praying in the Spirit and praying in their prayer language and praying in tongues, people that's been in churches, Pentecostal churches for years, acts like they've never even heard of such a thing. You know what most Pentecostal people think? They think that whenever you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you say a few words in an unknown tongue, and I got it! 
And then they just go somewhere, recline back and say, Whoa, I'm ready for heaven. I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost and ready for heaven. No, you just got inside the door good. There's a whole world out there to be explored in God. Amen? It's like the little boy, his mama put him to bed. And after she put him to bed, she just barely got him in the bed. He was so sleepy and he's a little bit heavy. And after she left out, the little boy fell out of bed. And the mama came running back in there and she said, what happened to you? He said, mama, I guess I fell out too close to where I got in. And that's the way it is with a lot of Pentecostal people. You just barely get into the Holy Spirit and don't ever go any further and don't move on deeper in God. And the first news you know, you fall away even from the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Fall away. And then want to become a part of a church that doesn't even believe in the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Ashamed of the Holy Spirit. And you want spoken tongues. But you fell out so close to the place where you got in. You got to move on. You got to move on in. God's got stuff for you. If you, if you just knew what God's got for you. If you just knew what God's got for you, there's a realm, a dimension in the Spirit of God that you can't begin to imagine the benefits that he has for you. Whew, man, I don't think I can go much further. Stand with me real quick. I'll come back. I'm going to try. Just begin to worship him right now. Huh. Whoa!
Hallelujah. Wow. be seated. I'm going to try to go on. <laughs> Building up yourselves in the Holy Ghost. Building up yourselves in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost building up yourselves in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. If it wasn't possible to pray in the Holy Ghost, the Bible wouldn't tell us to do it. Friend, this is New Testament. I, in the course of these messages, I'm going to take you into Corinthians. I'm going to take you into Romans. I'm going to take you into the, the Gospels. Have you ever thought about in the Scriptures, and this is completely off, it's just come to my mind, 
You remember over in the parables, the Bible says that the word was sown. And it says it was sown on thorny soil. It was th sown on different kinds of soil. And then it says it's sown on good soil. And what kind of percentages did that seed produce? It says some produced 30. And some produced 60. And some produced 100%. I really wonder, in the body of Christ, in our time, how many churches are operating on 30% power? I have to be careful here. Ay, 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 ay. Churches that resist the Holy Ghost, Resist prayer language. Resist tongues. Resist the power. Resist the Holy Spirit with exceptions of just what they want of Him. We'll take the comforter. We'll take that. Tongues, we don't want that. Holy Spirit, keep your tongues. We'll take your comfort. Uh, Holy Spirit, we don't want your praying in the Spirit, praying in the Holy Ghost, building up yourself. In the no, we don't want that. No. We'll take the comfort. We'll take the guidance. We'll take the uh, directing our steps. We'll take the candle of the Lord. We'll take that. That's good. That's not offensive. We can handle that. But uh, stabbing lips, keep that. Uh, let's see. Uh, tongues and interpretation tongues. No, we don't want that in our churches. Let's see. Uh, prophecy. Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, no prophecy. Does that sound absurd? That's exactly what's happening. And I'm going to tell you something else. Just because a man puts on a robe and his collar turned backwards does not make him the truth. And just because a man or a woman gets behind a pulpit and preaches something to you does not make it the all-inclusive truth, including myself. That's why the Bible says, search the Scriptures. Don't depend on a man to tell you what you need to know. Search the Scriptures, for in them... You think you have eternal life. And the Bible also says you don't have any need for man to teach you. It said the Holy Ghost will guide you into all truth. Now what that means is yes, you need pastors. And yes, you need ministers. And yes, you need the fivefold gifts for the edification of the church. Yes, you must have it. But there's many behind pulpits that will not tell you the truth. They'll only tell you what they're comfortable telling you. And they'll only want to build a church that's comfort, comfortable to them for people to only learn so much information and they're comfortable with the church having that much information but no more. So just because a man stands by the pulpit and tells you something about the Holy Spirit doesn't make it true. That's why you need to depend on the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, is there such a thing as speaking in tongues? And he'll say, mm-hmm. Holy Spirit, is there such a thing as praying in the Holy Ghost? He'll say, mm-hmm. And then after you keep talking to him like that, you'll say something like this. Well, Holy Spirit, I've always been taught against that. And I've lived a basically defeated life. Holy Spirit, you are one of the Godhead. And right now, I want to trust myself to you. I want to put my faith in you. Holy Spirit, would you come and baptize me with the Holy Ghost? And I give you permission to begin to speak through me with other tongues. You know what will happen? You'll take off. And you know one of the things that will happen to you? You'll resent that you've been lied to all those years. Friend, let me just make this clear before I move on. I'm not used to this, hallelujah. <laughs> let, me make this one, let me make this one thing extremely clear. This is in your Bible. You can't take an eraser and erase that out. And you can't take the page and rip it out. You can't do it. It's in your Bible. And it's part of the Pauline epistles that Paul wrote. It's all through there. And you just can't take the parts you want and leave the parts you want. You can't do that. It's all the gospel for all the people. Now, I got one more point. I won't be able to get to my fourth one. 
Praying in the Spirit is very powerful because the Holy Spirit will show you mysteries. This is the part I've been wanting to get to for so long. You ready? Hallelujah. How many of you need wisdom? <laughs> How many of you really covet and you really want wisdom? I do too. Now let me tell you what a mystery is. A mystery is something that is hidden. If God wanted to, if God wanted to hide something so you could never find it, you would never find it. You'd never even know about it. You'd never even know you could know about it. But a mystery means he's got things covered over and he's got some things tucked away And God keeps certain things for certain dispensations and certain times. <clears throat> like the Bible says, for example, in the book of Daniel, shut up the book until the time of the end. Men shall run to and fro, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But when God was giving Daniel the prophecies in the book of Daniel, he said, shut up the book until the time of the end. Well, all of a sudden, we find ourselves in the time of the end. But if you read the book of Daniel with your mind, you'll never understand it. But the Holy Ghost can take it and give you understanding. Let me tell you what a mystery is. When you think of a mystery, I think of Sherlock Holmes. You know what Sherlock Holmes would do? He'll take a little evidence here, and he'll take a little bit over there. He'll lift it out, take a little bit over here, and then an investigator like that can take bits and pieces of evidence. And then when he puts those pieces of evidence together, it solves the mystery. It's like that investigator, that private investigator, is gifted somehow with a sense that he can lift things that other people just look at. They don't see what he sees. He can lift a piece of evidence here, a piece of evidence over yonder, and go out in the backyard and lift a piece of evidence there. Everybody walked around and nobody saw it. But then when he takes, takes the pieces of evidence and he clumps them together, it becomes evident what happened. And the mystery solved. The Bible says, in regard to Christ, that God kept him a mystery in the Old Testament. He dropped evidence all down through different books. Micah, Isaiah, Zechariah, Jeremiah. He dropped evidence all through the Old Testament about Jesus. Peace here and a peace there. But nobody saw it. And then all of a sudden, Jesus comes, and they still didn't see it. He walked their shores. They still didn't see it. The Lamb of God was there the King of glory, the Son of the Most High, Jehovah God, and they didn't even see him. If they had seen him, they would not have crucified him. So God kept it a mystery until he died and was resurrected, and then Holy Spirit came, and Holy Spirit began to move in the early church through a man by the name of the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Paul said, I pray in tongues more than any of you, thank you. And through that praying in tongues, the Holy Spirit began to let him lift evidence from different places. And all of a sudden, Paul began to write in his Pauline epistles, the mystery of godliness and the mystery of Christ. He lifted a little from Isaiah. He lifted a little bit from Genesis. He lifted a little bit from all those because he was well-founded in the Jewish word. That's who he was. He was a scholar in Jewish word. And he lifted those pieces. How did he do it? Holy Spirit came and gave him the pieces of evidence. And he put them all together. And when the Holy Spirit put them all together in the life of Paul, he said, now write. And as I write, as Paul began to write the Pauline epistles, and I read them today, my heart says, glory to God. See? All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes and he puts the pieces together. And there's a picture. Now, just as the Holy Spirit did that with Jesus, let me tell you something. 
I've said this before down through the years. I don't want to go back and cover old territory. But let me just show you something here real quick. There's three different ways to see. Like you see my tie. If you don't, you got problems. <laughs> this is birthday present. Hallelujah. This is my tie. You can see that tie. I can see you. I see this audience. I see those lights. I see the stained glass windows up there. I can see. And then my soul can see. I remember when I went to school. I remember the day. I'll never forget the day. I was in school. And my math teacher was up and she was teaching me mathematics. And at first I had a little problem catching on. You know, just sitting in a class with everybody else. But one day I focused in and Miss Huff, my first grade teacher, I remember she put up there one plus one equals two. And then she put up there two plus two equals four. And while she was teaching that, the eyes of my understanding was enlightened of my soul and I said, I see. And I understood mathematics. And I went from that, and I went into algebra, I went into geometry, and I went into modern math. I got it. I see. Just as my eyes can see, and just as my soul can see, your spirit also can see. You know what? I have never seen Jesus, because he's seated at the right hand of the Father, I've never seen him, have you? You see? They tell me that he walked the shores of Galilee 2,000 years ago. They tell me that he lived a sinless life and he died on Calvary for the sins of mankind. They tell me that. Then, all of a sudden, Holy Spirit came, put it all together, and I said, oh my God, I see. And I have never doubted Jesus since the time Holy Spirit showed him to me. He didn't show me his hair. He didn't show me his eyes. He didn't show me how tall he was. But he showed me in the Word of God that he's a Savior and the King and the Lord of Lords. And my soul said, yes, I see. Whoa. Now, the same way I saw him and I believed, there's many other things that Holy Spirit's wanting to show. And he's picking up pieces of evidence, again in Daniel, in the book of the Revelation, in the book of Zechariah. And I now understand there's going to be an Antichrist. I understand there's going to be perilous times. And I understand that the devil is going to be like a vicious roaring lion. And I said, I see. And he picks up all the pieces, he puts them together, and I see it. I see by Holy Spirit putting the pieces of evidence together that there's healing in the atonement. I believe that there's power in the Holy Ghost. How do I know that? Because the Holy Ghost has shown me. You know what? Let's get back to this mystery just for a minute. I want to show you some powerful scripture. I'm not just going to take just a moment. Go to 1 Corinthians 2, 1 Corinthians 4, and 1 Corinthians 14. I'm going to close with this. I'm not going to go any further. 1 Corinthians 2. Apostle Paul, man, he was so deep. Can you imagine a man that persecuted the early church? A Jewish scholar. I mean, he was a Jew of Jews. When God got a hold of him, God took all that Jewish knowledge that he had, lifted it, lifted all that evidence that he knew, and then the Holy Spirit put it all together, and then he said, I want to use you to write most of the New Testament. And the Apostle Paul began to take those pieces of evidence. The Holy Spirit put it all together for him. And I believe one of the major ways that the Holy Spirit put it together for Paul was as he would pray in the Spirit, it would enlighten him. God would show him mysteries as he prayed in the Spirit. You might say, uh-oh, you're getting a little bit weird now, Pastor. No, just hang on, friend. I want to show you some powerful scripture. 
When I get to the last one, you'll understand. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 7. It says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Let me, let me look at, I want to get you to look at that one more time, verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even hidden wisdom. Now I'm going to ask you, if you will, please to read it with me just like I just read it. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. And the Bible said it's a wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now look at chapter 4 and verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ, and Paul said, and stewards of the ministry, of the mysteries of God. Look at that. And stewards of of the mysteries of God. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's just hold there just a moment. Paul said, let us be brought into account that we are the stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, what is mysteries? It's something that's not real evident, something that's hidden. It's something that's evidentiary but it hasn't been lifted. Now, I don't have time to, to, to labor here. Let me just say it by saying this. If there's mysteries of God, and God didn't want us to know about them, why would he tell us about them in the first place? Secondly of all, if there's mysteries of God, They couldn't be a mystery to God because God is omniscient and He knows everything. So, if there's mysteries of God and we are stewards of those mysteries, God doesn't have any mysteries because He knows everything. Second of all, if there's mysteries of God, why would God tell us about them if He didn't want us to look into them? Why? I want to show you a powerful scripture and this ties it all together. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. This ties it all together. This ties it all together. Here it is. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understands him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Whew. You see it? You see it? Okay, look this way now. That's why I told you I'm coming to you today by way of instruction. Listen to me again. Let me go over it again. If I have a mystery and I go in before God and I say, God, I want to tell you something you don't know. Can't you see the Lord looking at me like, try it. You know. So you don't tell God mysteries. Okay? So if there's a mystery, it's not a mystery to God. And if Paul said we are stewards of the mysteries of God, it means that there's some things that God's got, they're powerful, they're precious, and they're not really evidentiary to a lot of people. And if you're stewards of the mysteries, it means that God will reveal the mysteries. And then when you look in 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2, it says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. Let me stop right there just for a minute. Sometime when you're speaking in tongues, the devil will say, Are you back to that old gibberish again? The devil will try to intimidate you by speaking in tongues, and he'll say, Are you murmuring again that old mess that they taught you over there in that church and they told you that you could speak? There's nothing to that. 
and the, and the devil will try to intimidate you not to move in unknown tongues because that's the power and that's the way mysteries are revealed by the Holy Ghost. And I want to ask you a question. If it wasn't possible to speak in an unknown tongue, why does the Bible say that you can do it? It is an unknown tongue. And you say, but my mind is insulted. Good. Good. It's supposed to be. We've got too big for our britches anyway. We're a computer age crowd today. We know all this stuff. You know, we know computers. We know all this. We know that. We know everything. We're big boys. We've been educated. We're a la dee da <laughs> Don't get me worked up, friend. I'm trying to be sweet today. Well, la dee da Yeah, we're smart, all right. We're too big for our britches. And the Lord said, I've got a language that you can pray in that your mind doesn't understand. And it's an unknown tongue. And you say, oh, that hurts my mind to even think about an unknown tongue. Good. Because if it hurts your mind, it hurts the devil's mind too. Now watch this. It says, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. Whoa. Whoa. You leave the outer court. You press past the inner, the holy place, you move into the most holy place. And now you're speaking to God with some kind of language that you don't even understand. So you're speaking to God with some kind of language you don't understand. Somebody says, I tell you, that's just too much for me. That's just too much for me. It sure is. Too much for me too. But I wouldn't trade it for a million. I wouldn't trade it for a billion dollars. But look at this now, the last part of that verse is so powerful. How be it, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it says, Speak unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him. No man understandeth him. How be it in the Spirit, he speaketh mysteries. How be it in the Spirit, he speaketh mysteries. Paul said, I'm closing, Paul said, I speak in tongues more than all of you. You know what? There's a lot of people that preach that message in Corinthians where Paul said, He that speaketh in tongues edifieth himself, but you ought to speak in tongues so the whole congregation can hear. They think, they try to put a slant on that and put a spin on that like, you shouldn't speak in tongues because you're only blowing yourself up in pride. It doesn't mean that at all. Here's what it means. It says, He that speaketh in tongues edifies himself. There's a realm that you get in by speaking in tongues where the Holy Ghost is building you up in the most holy faith and edifying you. See? They want to make it appear like somebody who speaks in tongues is full of pride and try to draw attention to themselves. That's not the truth. Don't let anybody tell you that's the truth. But when you start speaking in tongues and in an unknown language, in a prayer language, you start speaking mysteries. And when you start speaking mysteries, the Holy Ghost in you is bringing all the evidentiary pieces together. And as you start praying in the Spirit, all of a sudden things come together. And you say, oh my God, I see. How did that happen? Your mind couldn't even think about that kind of stuff. But when you got into the dimension and the realm of the Holy Spirit, it downloaded it. Glory to God. I felt good to say that. Oh, man, I'm high-tech, friend. Amen. <laughs> Ooh, I'm high-tech. Come on now. Glory to God. Just your spirit downloads that information from heaven by praying in the spirit. It's just like, whoosh. How many of you know you can put the Library of Congress now on a little chip? Where it would take a room this big or bigger for the Library of Congress, you can put it on a chip. That's what the Holy Ghost does. You download, whoosh. It's like when you pray in your mind, you have to pull every book off the shelf and read it all. But when you download it, ooh. Somebody say, ooh. That's what I say. Let's go. Speak mysteries of God.
A man is speaking in an unknown tongue. A woman is speaking in an unknown tongue. A young person is speaking in unknown tongues. Is not speaking unto men, the Bible says, but speaking unto God. How be it, he's speaking the mysteries of God. Did you know when you're praying in tongues, you're speaking mysteries? That's why Paul said, we're stewards of the mysteries of God. It grieves my heart to see so many good people that love the Lord and they're solid people, principled people that's being robbed of information in regard to the Holy Spirit that they so desperately need. It, it grieves my spirit that preachers won't let them know and won't tell them and won't educate them in regard to the Holy Spirit. Somebody says, well, Brother Kilpatrick, when you do that, you're really setting yourself up to be lamb blasted. Friend, I've been so lamb blasted, I don't give a flip who lamb blasts me. I mean, listen, I've been so lamb blasted I got a letter the other day when I preached on Masons, you know, I preached a message about Masons. I was trying to help the church understand about Masons. I got a letter from one lady, I opened it up, and she said, God bless you, son, for preaching the truth unafraid. And I said, well, praise God. Opened up the next letter, how dare you, you know. <laughs> That's the way it goes. But listen, one day when I stand before God, I want to stand before him and I want him to say to me, John, you told them what I told you to tell them. And you wasn't afraid. And friend, listen, I'm, I'm this type of a guy. Whatever I do, I'm going to do it with all my might. If I believe in it, I'm going to do it with all my might. And I believe in this book and I believe in the church. And I'm going to tell you everything I feel like you need to know, whether you like it or not. And even after today, some of you may say, I'll never go back to that church. You know what? But while you're here, I had a chance to tell you. And you'll never forget it. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. You know what I'd like to do right quick? I'll get back on this again next time I preach. I'll be in California next week. I have to be in California. I've been booked out there for a long time. I wanted to make sure before I go that the church was okay before I left. Chaplain Robertson, of course, is back now from Korea, and Chaplain is my trusted friend. Wonderful, wonderful, able brother that God has given us here in my absence. But I'll be in California next Sunday, but I'll be back the next Sunday to preach to you again. And I wasn't going to go pretty well made up my mind the night of the 4th that I wasn't going to go, but the church has done so well. Everybody seems so reconciled and comforted by the Spirit of God. I feel peace to go, and I feel that I need to go. So I'll be gone next Sunday, but the next Sunday when I get back, I'm going to continue this series. And I believe that God's going to bless it. And i tell you what I think is happening here at Brownsville. I believe the Holy Spirit has taken us into this territory for a reason. I've never preached before on prayer language. I've been preaching for 34 years. Never preached on prayer language. And I apologize, Holy Spirit, that I haven't done that. But there's a reason for it. And I feel like in the dimension where God's about to take Browns, well, we're going to need to do that more and more. Amen. Hallelujah. Whew, wow. Let's lift our hands one more time and just begin to worship Him. Come on. She and the chorus Right there where you are, before we leave, there was so many hands went up all ago. My heart of compassion went out to the audience, to the congregation. Before we leave this building, I want us to pray for one another. And I tell you what, if you're not uncomfortable doing it, I'd like for you to pray for one another in the spirit, if that's okay. If you're uncomfortable, you don't have to do that. And I'm not asking you to, you know, conjure up something. But if you feel comfortable enough to pray for your friend in the spirit, I'd like for female to get with a female 
male with a male and like for us just to begin to pray for one another the spirit because things are going to begin to just back off and break off as we begin to do that. And I feel led to ask you to do that before we leave. So would you find a prayer partner right quick and both of you to begin in agreement, pray in the spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Powerful Holy Ghost. Powerful Holy Ghost. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, build yourself up again in the whole most holy faith. Power, 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 power. In the powerful and the mighty name of Jesus. In the powerful and the mighty name of Jesus. In the powerful name of Jesus.
How many of you can say I actually feel better? It has been good to have been in the house of the Lord. Amen. I want to, I want to exhort you before you leave, please. Let me exhort you just for a moment. This week, steal away and begin to do something you haven't done in a long time, if ever. Just steal away and begin to spend some time praying in the Holy Ghost. You might say, Brother Kilpatrick, I can't do it. You know what? You'll probably find it's easier and powerful to pray in the Spirit sometime than it is trying to think of things to pray for in English and in the natural. How many of you have ever, ever prayed in the Spirit before? Let me see your hand, please. Yeah, that's what I thought. Almost everybody. Let me say it one more time before I let you go. If there was not such a thing, it would not be in the Holy Scriptures. It's there in black and white all through there. It's in the writings of Paul. Jesus talked about it. The Bible even says with the stammering lips he'll speak to his people. Just keep going. The Bible says in Acts 2 and 4, as the Spirit gave them utterance. So many of our churches used to practice it and believe in it, prayed for people to receive the baptism, wasn't ashamed of it when it was on the other side of the tracks. But now God's blessed us and we're on this side of the tracks and now we're ashamed of it. And that's why our churches are in such hell they're in is because we've relegated the Holy Ghost right out the door. But I'm here to tell him he's welcome at Brownsville. He's welcome at Brownsville. Hallelujah. God bless you.